Today on the Unafraid Show, we got to rank the ACC from top to bottom. And Nick Saban went up on Capitol Hill to talk about name, image, and likeness. Oh boy, do I have a reaction. And we have special guest, defensive coordinator from the Arizona State Sun Devils, Mr. Brian Ward is in the building. And we got to talk about women's college basketball because all publicity is good publicity. And it's time for the Unafraid Show. Let's go. It's time to rank the new ACC football from number one to 16. Now, this ranking is based upon which teams will win the most Atlantic Coast Conference games over the next five seasons. Let's start with number 16. Actually, before we even get to number 16, there is some fine print because the ACC list was more tricky than the Big Ten, Big 12, and the SEC because are we even sure that this conference will be a conference in five years thanks to Florida State, Clemson, and others trying to get up out of there because of their FOMO about some money? But now on to the list. Number 16, Boston College. The Eagles haven't had a winning record in the ACC since 2009. And the administration's response to Jeff Halfley leaving his head coaching post for a coordinator position in the NFL was to bring in Bill O'Brien, who has left being a college coach for the NFL not once, not twice, but three times now. My question about this team is, does Bill O'Brien want to be at Boston College or did he just want a head coaching job wherever would have him? Because Boston College fans deserve somebody that wants to stick around long term and lift them out of mediocrity because I think Bill O'Brien is a very good coach but my doubts about how he'll perform in this role have everything to do with my doubts that he's all in on doing whatever it takes to embrace the new landscape of college football that actually chased their last head coach Jeff Halfley away number 15 Pittsburgh Pat Narduzzi their coach had an opportunity a couple years back to move the pit offense into the future by promoting Brandon Marion. And he decided to go in a different direction and then had to watch Marion's UNLV offense rank 22nd in scoring in 23 while Pitt was at 116. So now Narduzzi, who is an elite defensive mind, has to put all his eggs in the Cade Bell basket, who came over from Western Carolina after leading the top offense in the FCS. Now, he does have transfer quarterback Eli Holstein coming in from Alabama, which could be the difference between Pat Narduzzi getting pit back into the top 25 conversation or him being in the unemployment line after this season, because if Pitt does have to regroup, I think that it will keep them near the bottom of the conference over the next five years. Number 14, Syracuse. It's Fran Brown time, baby. And you have a high school quarterback from the Northeast who played DB in the South and then went on to coach in the Northeast and win a national championship as a defensive staffer at Georgia. Now, it's not hard to see what Syracuse is doing here. And it has paid immediate dividends with the Orange collecting a top 40 recruiting class and a top 25 transfer class this year. But can Fran Brown turn this talent into wins? Because that's the big unknown and the reason why I have them so low. Because without any other information, I have to factor in the school's god-awful history of having two conference wins or less in 14 of their last 19 seasons. But there is a major upside with Brown, though. Because when he said he's not leaving Syracuse, I actually believed him. Number 13, Wake Forest. Now, before y'all get all upset, I do get that the Demon Deacons are coming off off one of their better runs in school history. They were ranked in the AP top 10 at one point in both 21 and the 22 season. And that has translated into being a middle of the pack recruiting destination in the ACC. But last year, Dave Clawson's squad regressed to a one in seven conference record and averaged under 16 points per game in conference play. Now they'll have 24 year old Hank Bachmeyer competing to take this offense over and right this ship. But if that doesn't work, though, it might take some serious staff changes, something that Dave Clawson doesn't like to do to get this offense back on track. Number 12, Virginia. Tony Elliott has to win right now. But if you look at the fact that Virginia secured back-to-back -to -back top 50 transfer classes, I think that 2024 could see a return to bowl eligibility. And this team showed some serious promise in some of their close losses and one big win. Now, the Cavaliers have had two quarterbacks that have shown some flashes of high-level play in Tony Musket and Anthony Colandrea. 
And if they can get some support in the run game, you might actually see this offense take off because that's the one area where Virginia really worries me is an inability to rush the passer in a conference where comfortable quarterbacks will get you killed. Number 11, Virginia Tech. Brent Pry did seemingly the impossible and got the Hokies offense back on track in 2023. Now, I did find it alarming that this year's transfer class was ranked so low, but it might be evidence that Virginia Tech didn't have as many immediate rocks roster holes that needed to be filled. Now, Kyron Drones took care of the ball last season and is primed for a huge leap forward. Baylor should have never let that kid walk out the door, but the Bears' loss is the Hokies' gain, plus running back Bashul Tootin returns. And I'm not convinced that Virginia Tech is primed for long-term success, but a run at ACC supremacy in 2024 isn't out of the question. Number 10, Cal. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that Cal's conference headquarters is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they're in the Atlantic Coast Conference, and they're on the West Coast. But anyways, Cal does have access to something that I believe that will keep them competitive in the ACC, that is West Coast athletes. Because they're also entering the ACC with a top four running attack and maybe the best running back in the conference in Jaden Ott. Plus, Justin Wilcox isn't going to be afraid of these ACC offenses. But these road games are going to be a grind. And Cal is about to have his fourth dude in the last 16 months calling the offense. And the floor and ceiling are very close together for this Golden Bears team because they were struggling to be relevant in the Pac-12. Now the question is, is a cross-country change of scenery the key to Cal's success? Because I expect four to five ACC wins each year out of this team because if Justin Wilcox has success, he'll absolutely leave Cal for more money and resources. And if he doesn't, he'll be gone, which will put the next coach in a bind. Number nine, North Carolina. I'm not being ages here, people, but Mac Brown is the oldest head coach in college football, and he is not going to be coaching this team in five years. And it's the fear of the unknown that has me putting the Tar Heels right in the middle of the ACC pack when it comes to ACC success over the next half decade. Because even though they're losing Drake May, they still have Omarion Hampton to lean on in 2024. And if they can hang on to 2025 in-state quarterback Bryce Baker, this offense could stay dangerous until 2028. But offense is never North Carolina's problem. It's the defense that has given up over 30 points per game in the last three years combined that would have fans worried and until that gets fixed the Tar Heels will be good but never great number eight Stanford I don't think that Stanford is going to have as much of an issue globe trotting around this great country as their Bay Area rival school does but the team recruits the best and the brightest all over the country anyway so having to play on the East Coast I don't think it's going to be a big issue because they had over 30 players from the East Coast on last year's team alone and if their head coach, Troy Taylor, can get Stanford's recruiting back on track, there's no reason to think that Stanford can't be competitive in this league. But the Cardinal can't accomplish anything in the ACC without a high-level quarterback. Now, is Ashton Daniels that guy? We'll find out this year. Number seven, Duke. Welcome back to the ACC as a head coach, Manny Diaz. Three years in Miami and a 21-15 and 15 record earned Diaz a pink slip. And you know he's been counting down the days to get another shot to prove that he can lead a team of his own. And he's going to get one hell of a quarterback in Malik Murphy from Texas to do that with. Because Duke's not an easy place to win consistently. But Mike Elko did leave the program in great shape when he left for Texas A&M. And Manny Diaz, if he can keep the ship steady, the Blue Devils will have one of the better programs in the ACC over the next five years. Number six, Georgia Tech. Brent Key took over as an interim coach in 2022, earned the job, and then proved himself again in 2023 by taking Georgia Tech to a bowl game. And if he's the one that made the decision to move Javal Hayes from wide receiver to running back, he might be just a genius because Georgia is one of the most talent-rich states in the country. And if the Yellow Jackets can take advantage of bounce backs in the portal, and you add that to the fact that they pulled in a top 35 prep class this year, you're going to see an unprecedented era of success for this team number five Miami Hurricanes now you can say whatever you want about Mario Cristobal has he underachieved sure is he still a top five recruiter in America absolutely because he actually might be top three and now he's convinced Cam Ward to be a hurricane and stay in school another year as their quarterback if Miami is ever going to be back this might be the year because six top 100 recruits in 2024 to go along with 11 of the top 200 last year 
man, this roster is loaded. And if Mario Cristobal can't win with this team, maybe he can't win at Miami. Number four, Clemson. I disagree with Dabo Sweeney's position on the transfer portal, but the Tigers still recruit at a level that the bottom will never really drop out. But that 12-year run of 2011 to 2022 where Clemson averaged less than one conference loss per year, those days are over, buddy. Because Clemson might even win the ACC a couple of times over the next five seasons. But being fully anti-portal makes any of Dabo's players that aren't getting on the field right away a target for everybody in the country. Trying to delay the inevitable is admirable, but the Tigers are doing this at their own risk. Number three, North Carolina State. I got the Wolfpack ranked so high for two reasons. First off, they went 9-4 and four last year despite losing their quarterback, Devin Leary, and not having any offensive players on the ACC all-first team list. And second, Dave Dern was filling himself so much last year that he went on TV after Steve Smith. Do you know how crazy you have to be to trash talk Steve Smith in the state of North Carolina? That man might actually show up at your house. And North Carolina State capitalized on last year's momentum and absolutely crushed this recruiting class, 27th overall for high school and 12th in the portal. Watch for Duke transfer Jordan Waters to give NC State the rushing attack that it needed in 2023. Number two, Louisville. Jeff Brom is awesome. 10 wins with Jack Plummer, Jawar Jordan, and Jamari Thrash. If you're a kid with something to prove and you're in the transfer portal, how could you not want to play for that dude? I'm actually positive that that's why Tyler Shug, Penny Boone, and Ja'Cory Brooks decided to jump on board and see if they can push that 10 wins to 12. Because we haven't talked a lot about booster support because I'm not sure the gap between the schools is as pronounced as it is in some other conferences. But did I factor in the amount of support Louisville gets from its fan base in my decision to rank them number two? Yes, absolutely. Number one, Florida State. When FSU locked up Mike Norvell to keep him out of the running for the Alabama job, you know the rest of the ACC, boy, they was spitting mad. Not only did Mike Norvell not go to Alabama, he actually scored five of their best players out of the transfer portal and eight SEC transfers in total. DJ Uyangalele will try to pick up where Jordan Travis left off at quarterback. And in case you were wondering when DJ U gets his shot at Clemson, it is October 5th. But I do think that the Seminoles will be at their most vulnerable in 2024. But I also think that they're set up to win this conference at least three times in the next five years. And that is as long as they, they don't force their way out of the conference. And at this point, with the expanded college football playoff, do they really even need to? You guys, we are on with Brian Ward, defensive coordinator for the Arizona State Sun Devils. Uh, Coach, thanks for coming on the show. No, I appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. You've been at a lot of stops throughout your whole entire career. What is the what, what have you taken from different locations and different places that you've been? Man, I've taken a lot. I mean, every spot that I've been, uh, you know, I've learned learned something from every spot. And you know, I was asked just actually, it's funny you asked that a couple weeks ago. Uh, someone asked me, you know, what was the best place you've been? What was the worst place you've been? And I said, geez, you know, there's there's a lot of best places, um, but I, you know, there wasn't really any spot that I disliked. Yeah. I mean, really, just when, when you're fortunate enough to, to be able to coach, you know, this game and football and be around and meet some of the people that you're able to meet, you're really uh, you're really around some of the best that that life has to offer. You got you're, you're around people that are motivated and and they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And, and we've, uh, you know, we've just been blessed to be able to be at the places we've been. So uh, we've taken some, something from every single place and, and I don't think I've ever had a bad stop. Yeah, so that means that football is important to you. So I, what, what has football meant for you in your, your life? I, I don't come from like a football like family or football background. And um, the sport that I was first involved with was boxing. Okay, my dad was actually he used to train fighters in our basement growing up. He yeah. used to live in our live with us, and so uh, boxing is very solitary. It's a very lonely sport. Yeah, and everything you do, you just do by yourself. So football, when I started playing in the seventh grade, I was like, like wow, that just opened my eyes. It's just something completely different. It was, yeah. it, it, it was guys with no matter what their background was, no matter what their ethnicity or culture or anything, we all came together and, and became you know instant friends, and and that was something that. Uh, 
because I moved around around a lot when I was younger. Yeah, it was uh, it was something that uh, just connected me with people. And how has you know growing up in a boxing family and that mentality, understanding how to work all by yourself, you got to run on the road when nobody's paying. How has that impacted you as a coach and how you teach? Yeah, it's interesting. There's there's a lot of uh, similarities to the sports, believe it or not. I mean, it just. You know whether you're talking about you know tackling, you got to be tough enough to be able to tackle and be yeah. able to, you know, use your body to get another guy on the ground, another trained athlete. So you better be in shape and you better train yourself enough to be you know big enough and strong enough to not only absorb, you know, a, a hit or but be able to you know take a guy and you know yeah. put him put him on the ground, um, and also just little things like controlling distance. You know, not letting another guy put his hands on you, and not let, not letting an offensive lineman when you're pass rushing, be able to get his hands on you when you're trying to create separation. And in boxing, styles styles make fights. So you, you can have a good boxer who, who can't get beat by a different guy who's not who can't beat anybody that that guy beat. 100%. So as a defensive coordinator, styles make, yeah. make, make fights. So how do you go into a week when one one week, you know, you're you're, you're playing against a, a spread team and then if if navy or army or somebody's on the schedule then you then you're playing the option then somebody is a run heavy team you know too tight end. like how do you yeah, you you it's like you've been in my meeting rooms or something like that. i mean i literally stuff I, I talk about all the time I mean, styles make fights styles make matchups and um you know you literally can look i mean i was just i mean i, I say this all the time like i can look down usually and, and doing it for as long as that i've done it and been at the different levels that i've been mm-hmm. at i mean you can literally look down the pipe of the season as a defensive coach sometimes, and you see your roster when things are kind of moving and you yeah. know, everything's kind of coming together. You, you can look and see the offenses and the quarterbacks you're about to play, and you, and you can you can predict you know pretty close to how well you're going to play that season. Uh, and and I'm, it's just because it's such a quarterback driven yeah. game, and you can't really separate that. And and uh, you know styles make matchups hundred percent. You know. Quarterbacks are really good that have offensive lines that can protect them. Yeah. And, you know, when you when you face teams like Washington and Oregon, we had the offensive lines that they had, um, you know, with the type of quarterbacks that they had, the years that they had. I mean, there's a correlation. And then yeah. you look at Caleb, you know, at USC, and you look at the, you know, you look at the season that he, that he had, and they say it was a down year. Well, Caleb did so much with his feet. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? The offense, I mean, can you imagine what he would do? you know, with the offensive lines. Yeah. I mean, that's why people have him ranked so high. You yeah. Know I and mean? so there's just, you know, there's, that's right. I mean, you're, you're hitting, you, you and I are like brothers from another mother or something. I mean, I literally, that's exactly these, all these things that he's saying are things that I yeah. say all the time. Is you can literally, you can, styles make matchups. And, you know, um, you know, it's, it, it's, you can literally look at a game and go, man, this needs to happen in order for us to win a game. When, when you have played, well, coached against so many d- different quarterbacks that have gone on to have success in the NFL or been drafted and all that stuff. When you finish a game or you're watching tape, are you saying to yourself, oh my God, this guy's an NFL guy? Or can you spot the guys that are going to have success in the league? That The quality of the quarterback has so much to do with the offensive line because as a defensive coordinator, like you usually can find ways to protect the protection, you know, to yeah. be able to get an extra hat in the protection. and. And most quarterbacks, regardless of who they are, if you can affect them, yeah, they, yeah. they become average really fast. Yep. And and regardless of the receivers, regardless of any of those things, but probably the best that I uh, that I I'd rather I'm glad I'm never going to have to see again is Lamar Lamar yeah. Jackson. Yeah, he was Oof. he was a problem. What are the hallmarks of great defenses like from from year to year when you have turnover at positions? Yeah, that's such a loaded. Loaded question, um, but a lot of it has to do with philosophy, and and philosophy and culture. And like you look at the Ravens and, and the success they had in the early two thousands. Yep. And they had arguably one of the least productive quarterbacks. I can't remember his name, but they ran the football. Oh, like crazy. Uh, Trent Trent Dilfer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it was they didn't even sign him the following year after. No, season. no, no. That I think they went five or six games straight that season that they won. Yeah. Without scoring an offensive touchdown, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're running the football, they're bleeding the clock, and it, you know the the college level is not a whole lot different. When you look at the the best defenses in the country, you know, save the teams that you know they, they you know, all eleven guys are getting drafted. Like the other teams, you're you're looking at a, a program philosophy of yeah. 
uh, you know, starting day one, you know, like getting them lined up to two by two, three by one slot, empty formations. Day two, you know, they're they're not showing, you know, they're not showing uh, motions until you know day four or five. Yeah. You know, long motions and adjusting, getting your guys comfortable, getting lined up to you know to basic formations, and then developing developing it from there. I mean, it's really a it's a holistic approach to playing defense. I mean, I've been places that. Hey, it was roll out. Let's get off the field an hour and a half. Let's get as many reps on offense as possible, and then we're done. And you get an hour to meet, and you know a little bit to. I mean, I've been at places yeah. you know like that. So um, you develop defense, and and it has to be complementary offensively. Right? Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And, and of you know, you, there's a correlation to field position, yards per play, yep. you know, and, and all those things. And and I think in, in managing the clock and time management, and understanding possessions and. You know, there's there's teams that um, that play great defense. We have, look at the quarterbacks that they have to play every year too. You know, what I mean, comparatively yeah. speaking, there's all those things. You know, factor into playing great defense. But the great defensive teams year in year out are the ones that really have a culture of defensive development. Because if I don't see the looks in the spring and the fall, and then I got to get ready for it in a week's time. Yeah, that's tough. And you talked about like the triple option. You know yep. what I mean? Like, if you never see the triple option, why does the triple option have so much success? Because nobody sees it. Because you don't see it, and yeah. there's no way to prepare for it until the week of that game. And those teams that have had success, you, you bring it up, University of Wyoming, you know what I mean? And being <laughs> from Wyoming, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, and I know Coach Bowl, like, yeah. you know, he, his philosophy was he was going to take over. He was going to take time in spring ball and fall camp, you know, to be yeah. able to prepare for, for that because he knew there was nothing that you could duplicate. That's a fact. Why come play for Coach Brian Ward? Because we're going to develop you, okay? Uh, we're going to make fundamentals the, the hallmark of what we do on defense, and we're going to make you play as fast as you ever can play on defense. There's never going to be any question. We're not going to change the way we develop you or teach you. We're not going to come up with new terms and new ways to coach you from day to day. It's literally going to be the foundation, and we're going to continue to reinforce those things so you can nonstop develop. And, Position coaches uh, will come and go, but the system will never stay. Will, will always stay the uh, same. It will never change. How do you keep your hair like that? Because that's perfect hair, man. All right, no, you've been, you've been talking to Coop. You're talking to no. my assistant coach. No. Okay. I get sweat about this all the time. Okay, listen, this is natural, okay? I don't drink. I don't smoke. I try to stay in shape. I live a clean life. And, uh, yeah, I'm just I'm holding on to every bit of color in my hair as possible. I just turned 50 last week. I mean, the thing is 51. just but, perfectly manicured you got the lineup is it this is perfect hair man I, 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 man you've been talking to people i'm telling you i got a mole in here you, man. I'm, nobody okay. told me did anybody tell me this? no i got a mole in here man you guys okay, man. he's coach ryan ward <laughs> defensive coordinator arizona state thanks for coming on i appreciate you all right thanks. Yeah, thank you <laughs> I want to talk about the fight for the soul of college football because that's what it really is, the soul of college football because so many of us fell in love with what college football or what we thought it stood for. It was loyalty, it was passion. There was an innocence to it that wasn't involved in the professionalism that the NFL offered. So I understand the discontentment of people when NIL, the transfer portal, and all of these other changes have happened in such a short period of time. Not only are there transfers, there's unlimited transfers and there's no transparency surround name, image, and likeness. And you have different conversations about what college football is really, really about. And oh, it's the, the game is dead and all this stuff. Well, it's really not. The ratings are fine. People's interest is fine. We just have to adapt to a new way of watching and looking at college football because things have changed. Your father's college football is not what college football looks like now. And it's really frustrating when you have the people who are gatekeepers of college football, partially the, the coaches and the athletic directors who are multimillionaires complaining about the system when they've been the main people who have been the beneficiaries of that system. This week, you had United States Senator and Cancun enthusiast Ted Cruz host a roundtable to make it look like the government has any collective will or even any interest to address major college football issues that they had decades 
needs to preemptively handle. And this part isn't news because they've been at this for a while now. I even had to testify in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee like four years ago about name, image, and likeness and how there could be some guardrails put in place. And you know what came of that? The NCAA spent over a hundred million dollars fighting name, image, and likeness. And that's not even talking about the Ed O'Bannon case and the Austin versus the NCAA as well. But the major headline from the round table is that the GOAT himself, Nick Saban, took to the podium to lend his voice and opinions to repairing the greatest game on earth. Because to me, the biggest question surrounding college football right now is how do we keep the pageantry, regionality, and the greatness of the game while understanding that the old model where the exchange of a scholarship for your talent is an unfair exchange now. And requesting that fans shoulder the burden for a paper play model that came out of a lack of uniform NIL legislation, that's unsustainable. But the question is, is Nick Saban the best man to lead us on a journey to save college football? Maybe there are some pros and some cons. Now on the pro side, you're not gonna find a more respected voice that's gonna be able to weigh in, especially one that has been pro player rights and has been open in recent years to a revenue sharing model, but has also been staunchly against the pitfalls of an employer employee relationship between the schools and the athletes that might actually backfire and erase some of current student athletes protections. Now on the other end, his experience recruiting modern athletes in the NIL era at the pinnacle of all programs, Alabama, isn't necessarily relatable to most of the 650 plus member institutions that actually carry football. Cause Nick Saban spent 2023 making $32,000 every single day before endorsements. And honestly, for how big of an impact Saban has in Tuscaloosa and on the business of college football in general, that salary was probably a bargain. But his winning ways correlated with his ability to get a good chunk of the country's best players. And this is America. Once players were legally allowed to explore the monetary market, what it was for their skill set, that old capitalist virtue of competition came into play. Because sometimes it's hard to process the irony of being a country where we're raised to believe that companies competition provides the greatest economic good for the consumer and the same country where we celebrate meritocracy of sport and the reward of out competing an opponent but it's competitive economic forces that are ruining our favorite sport make it make sense but back to nick saban his alma mater kent state it ain't having these caviar problems and our concern should be with the greatest good for all of student athletes, not just the high profile athletes and coaches at the high profile programs. Cause Saban might be the best and most effective voice on these issues, but he for sure is not the most relatable. And Nick Saban's sticking point about college football not being a traditional business because every penny generated has to be spent just doesn't hold water. Especially when we know that those pennies got spent on him, his assistants, the business, his boosters run, the administrator salaries and the school facilities. Just because an operation carries a title of nonprofit doesn't mean that there aren't blatantly obvious examples of profiteering. And the kids aren't stupid. They see it. They see the cars their coaches drive, the vacations they take, the jobs they leave for, the commercials they star in, and then the bonuses that they collect as a reward for the players on the field performing well that the players don't participate in. Now the players have begun to hold up a mirror to the environment that they've been forced to participate in and the adults in the room don't like the image that they're staring at. But none of the people that have been benefiting from the system for decades have volunteered at all to surrender any of the benefits that they've accrued in the name of saving the sport that they love and the athletes see it too. Look, I have a lot of the same concerns that the coaches do. College football would be a better and more sustainable product if kids were able to worry about focusing on being developed at their school of choice by coaches that were incentivized to develop them instead of take whatever portal shortcut is available to increase their own odds at an immediate payday for themselves. But the system was broken before the players even had the chance to participate in it. And the only way for it is to bring players to the table, allow them to negotiate contracts and share in the revenue their efforts help generate. And until we're ready to have that conversation, college football will continue to look like the auction draft, the same way that it always has been for the coaches and administrators that have never once complained about how it benefits them. So when coaches sit up here, oh, name image and likeness, the transfer portal is ruining college football. How? because it's coaches leaving that keeps the portal open. 
every time a head coach leaves and goes to take an NFL job, a coordinator job, or a different job at a different school. Nobody cares about the promises that were broken. Nobody cares about the buyout and the contract that was in place. No, they don't. And Nick Saban said, all the things that I believed in all of these years, 50 years of coaching no longer exist in college athletics. Yeah, you know what else didn't exist 50 years ago? You didn't have 15 to $75 million golden parachutes for coaches that got fired. You didn't 50 years ago have coaches that had a good solid job bounce into a, a lateral job because it paid more money. So we keep looking at the players as the problem, but the reality is the coaches, administrators, and the NCAA are the people that allowed this to happen. They knew with the new TV money and everybody's salaries going up that when once states enacted NIL laws, you knew and players figured out, oh, they're building new stadiums, coaches are getting raises, everybody, it is a for-profit business for everybody except for the player. And the players are like, hold up, we're the ones who are out there on the field. And that's the most un-American thing that we've seen is that everywhere else in every other line of work, the people that have a hand in generating the revenue get to participate in the revenue. And there is freedom and players transferring three, four times, is that good for them graduating? And is it good for them having some stable relationships and networking while they're in college, which is one of the best parts about it? No, it's terrible for it. But there will be a market correction the same way that there is for everything else. But one of the biggest things that needs to happen, and maybe Nick Saban is the guy to lead us out of it, is that name, image, and likeness needs to be put on front street, the contracts, everything else, that way, the schools, the collectives, everybody else has to uphold those deals and can't be making shadowy promises that they're not going to keep. And also the players are being held to a standard as well. Let that sink in. I don't believe that all publicity is good publicity in every area of life, but in the case of women's college basketball, that brawl that happened between LSU and South Carolina, it might be one of the best things that ever happened to a sport that's already rocketing to the moon as far as public interest. It's actually insane to think about the fact that we're living in an age where the most compelling college hoopers by far are in the women's game. And I'm not saying that in any sexist way. I'm saying that there's a whole lot of cottage industry built around hyping up young male basketball players because our society is obsessed with finding who's the next chosen one. Now the women haven't had that and yet they're still dominating the conversation right now. Cause when it comes to men's basketball, the game's international appeal has led to a large portion of the NBA's best players coming from overseas instead of the college game. And now you have guys like Purdue's Zach Eady, who's set to collect his second consecutive Naismith award, who probably won't even be an NBA lottery pick in 2024. But the best players in the women's college game are going to be your top picks in the WNBA draft. The NBA would absolutely kill to have ready-made stars that the WNBA is about to have. And now you have arguably the two best teams brawling it out on the court. Lord have mercy. Inject this into my veins because I can't decide if I want to see LSU and South Carolina meet for the championship or if I want to see Caitlin Clark and Iowa run up against both of those squads. And to Don Staley and Kim Mulkey, two of the absolute greatest characters in all of basketball right now, despite it being the right thing to do, there was no reason to apologize for the basketball watching community for your young lady's emotions. And you could tell that Kim Mulkey, she didn't even mean that apology anyway, saying that she wished Camila Cardozo had actually pushed Andrew Reese instead of 5'10 Flaw J Johnson. Now to quote Monique though, I would like to see it. But to Flaw J's brother, who was not only arrested for jumping the scores table, but also looked scared for his life when he realized just how big Cardozo is. I just hope that he has a comfortable couch because that's where he's going to be watching the games from from now on, buddy. Because whether it's LSU making a deep run or South Carolina or the Iowa Hawkeyes or super freshman Juju Watkins at USC, you know I'm going to be watching and so will you. And I can't wait to see what heroes and villains emerge throughout the rest of the tournament field. Because ESPN, 
genius move. When they got the tournament rights, it was some Doctor Strange level foresight. And you just know that the WNBA is gonna benefit from all this added attention. I'm talking TV rights, league expansion, commercial success for its players, it is all on the horizon. So if you're one of them people that's been too cool to embrace the women's game because you just, I just need my players to dunk, there's still time for you to repent and enjoy the next few weeks with the rest of us. And that's the Unafraid Show. Make sure that you like, subscribe, get notifications, and most of all, share with a friend so we can keep bringing you dope stuff. And I'll see you guys next week.